All right, a few announcements. I want to remind you, Monday night, which is tomorrow, in case you are retired and you don't even know what day of the week it is. Right? <laughs> Some people are that way. Monday night at 7 p.m., we have a prayer meeting right here because this should be a house of prayer. And God is good and shows up if we show up. See, he'll show up when we show up. We show up and say, Lord, do your thing, and we can allow the Lord to speak through us, to pray through us, and we're going to pray for mighty, powerful things to move on this earth, but God needs you to show up. So tomorrow night, 7 p.m., show up for prayer. Also, Wednesday night, we have Bible study, and you know what? Um, we're going through a class, and guess what it's about? Prayer. It's called Teach Us to Pray. By a man named Corey Russley wrote a book called Teach Us to Pray, and uh, Timothy, right over there, and myself have been teaching that, and Timothy was knocked out of the uh, ring for a short time because he had COVID, but he's back again, full force. Amen. And uh, he, uh, he taught last week, gave me a break, because I'd been teaching for three in a row. He taught last week, and it was on fire, you know? So show up. It's on fire at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday night. Also, once again, just to remind you, because I need reminders, you need reminders, next Saturday, set your clocks back one hour. Don't be those foolish people where the news says, well, you know, the actual time to set your clock back is like 1 a.m. Sunday. You know what? You won't be awake to do that, so do it Saturday. Don't wait till Sunday, because then you'll miss church, right? Also, your clock is set back. You know what that means? We've told you that you've heard it in your ears. That means that... If you don't do that, you're going to be an hour late to church. Is that right? Or an hour early? Oh, an hour early, then don't worry about it. <laughs> if you don't set them, that's fine. <laughs> anyway, that's next uh, Saturday. Set that clock back. Also, um, Brother Tyle's at the door there, that fine-looking young gentleman. And uh, he is going to be doing this. Uh, we, we, we have rarely kind of emphasize this, but we want to reemphasize this because we're family, and the family that sticks together, the family that prays together, stays together, and we need to be a network of each, uh, each other's lives to support each other in prayer and in the things that we share. So um, if you have been coming to this church but have never filled out a membership application, looks like that, Tao will hand you one at the door. Join us. Now you go, what do I need a piece of paper for? Well, I'll tell you one reason you need a piece of paper. Because when the church makes decisions that impact the church, that impact what we do, um, you have a voting right then to vote, okay? And we'd like you to be part of those decisions. We'd like you to be part of the prayerful, uh, concerned decisions to say, we have prayed, and God, I believe, is telling us to go this way and to do this thing. So please, if you have not become a member, please... Consider filling that form out as Tayo hands you that at the back door there. Also, next Sunday night is Healing Sunday, okay? It's a healing service at 6.30 p.m. Show up, but better yet, if you need healing, come, but better yet, bring somebody. Now, I'm going to tell you something, and you know, you might just think, I could tell you lots of stories, and I even have some people in this congregation right now, I know Essien's one of them, <laughs> who can tell you these things are true okay? The Lord will give me a word of knowledge about a particular thing, and I'll just say, well, you know, the Lord showed me this in prayer this morning. And sometimes it goes, so are you out there? And nobody raises their hand. But I'm telling you, they do come. Because Essien did that one time. And it's like, nobody raised their hand, but he said, well, you know, I was embarrassed, but here's the issue. And it was exactly what I had said. So when I say these things, you might think, well, we, nobody raised their hand. Maybe it really didn't happen. I'm telling you, 99% of the time, that person appears in our church, or in one of our lives within that next week or within that same day. So I'm going to tell you something, is right now, I don't, I really, I have no clue that this person could even be in here, but I want you to be aware of this for a reason, okay? So the Lord showed me this morning in prayer, I saw another thing, which it's out there, might be in here, okay? And it's not a wonderful thing, but it's a wonderful thing that God can heal, okay? So I saw uh, in a, the jaw, right side, right through here, bone cancer in the jaw, okay? I saw that clearly. So what I'm saying, if you're here and have that, you know anything about the right side of the jaw, you've got some weird issue there. We want to pray for you right now. But 
and I'll say in a minute, I'll say if, you, if you're here, raise your hand. But if not, I want you to do this through this whole week. Be aware, you may be encountering a person and this conversation comes up and you say, yeah, my pastor was talking about that, all right? Then you're the one. Pray for them knowing this, that if God showed us this, it's because he wants to heal that. So be the one, be ready, and at the very least, drag them to church next week and we'll all pray for them, okay? But I want you to be aware that uh, God shows us these things, not just so he can say, see, there it is, but so that he can heal. All right? That's the purpose. So before we move on, I just want to say, is there anybody here that knows any of that in their lives right now? If not, be aware. I see these things usually within 24 hours, it pops up. But let's be aware, all of us. It's usually I'm looking for it. You look for it too, okay? If that comes up in a conversation, pray for them in faith. And you can have faith in this. The fact that God brought it up is the fact that God wants to heal it, okay? All right, so uh, also at the end of the service, Ty will be back there with that little bag for the offering. We do that at the end. All right, enough of the announcements. We've got a message today, and we've got to get it out before time is gone, okay? Now, I did a uh, three-part series called With Jesus very recently. But I want you to know when I when I write the sermon, it truly is God giving it to me at the time I write it because I usually have no idea what I'm preaching next. So the fact that that series went on for three particular chapters, we'll say, I didn't know at the beginning it would be three, but I just keep doing what God says to do. So this time, it's a different one, but really it seems very related because this time it's called without him. Without him. It was with him, but now it's without him. Now, to the believer who knows Jesus personally and intimately, and I hope that you all know Jesus personally and intimately, the worst thought that could ever come to your mind is a thought of living without Jesus. Can you imagine if Jesus was just taken out of your life completely and you're on your own now? I don't know how I made it in life without Jesus before. But now that I know him, I certainly don't know how I could ever make it without him. I don't know how the world makes it without him. I know some of them make it only by medicating themselves, by a lot of drinking or drugging to numb themselves from the pain of a life without Jesus, a hopeless life, a life that has no, no destiny. But that shouldn't be us, should it? I can't imagine. I've faced some huge trials in life, and so have you. I can't imagine being in the midst of those fiery furnaces, those trials, and not having Jesus. Can you? I can't imagine. I can't imagine life having any true meaning or purpose without Him. Because there really isn't. Many years ago, there was a song that was written that some of us older folks got to say that now, we'll remember. It was called Without Him. And it goes like this. I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to give you some lines from it. Without Him, I could do nothing. Okay. So, without Him, I could do nothing. Without Him, I'd surely fail. Without Him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Without Him, I would be dying. Without Him, I'd be enslaved. Without Him, life would be worthless. But Jesus, thank God I'm saved. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, do you know him today? Please turn him, don't turn him away. Oh, Jesus, my Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. Without him, how lost I would be. Boy, I know how lost I would be. Do you realize how lost you would be without Jesus? Well, thank God for Jesus. Thank God I'm not without him. Thank God you're not without him. On your worst day, it's your worst day with Jesus. Imagine it without Jesus. Yeah, I don't know about you, but in my heart, I know beyond any shadow of doubt, without him, I would be broken and lost and without hope, without joy, without purpose, right? Thank God he found me. Thank God he had mercy on me. Thank God he saved me from my godless life. And thank God he brought me into his glorious presence. I've stood in the presence of the King of Kings. Have you? 
Not everybody gets to do that, but his children do. We get to stand in his presence. I was in a pit that I couldn't climb out of. I cried in my hopeless despair for someone to help me. I didn't know what was out there. And then in the darkness, he reached down and he pulled me up out of that pit, he pulled me into the light, set my feet on solid rock. Psalms 40, 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up from the pit of despair out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock and made my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Oh, Jesus is good. I'm so glad I'm not without him. Everyone should have a salvation story. It's called your testimony. It's an awareness of what Jesus did when you were helpless, hopeless, and lost. Without him, people just drift through life aimlessly, without direction, carried about by the winds and currents of just circumstances, not having any idea where they're going to end up. Now, is that the kind of life we should be living? Oh, we should have purpose. We should have direction. John 15, 5 says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You know, there are some ministries who are based on a man without Jesus. In the big picture, they accomplish nothing. That man may accomplish something. He may accomplish a big fancy house or something or a lot of money or something. But in the kingdom, he's, a, he's accomplished nothing. Because without him, you can't do anything of value, anything of lasting worth. It doesn't matter if you have all the riches you could ever desire. It doesn't matter if you had all the power on earth to do whatever you want. Without him, as Solomon said, life is vanity and vexation of spirit. It's meaningless. It's meaningless. Aimlessness is a word that comes to mind when thinking about living without him. And this is how it's defined in the dictionary, aimlessness, without purpose or direction. Another word that comes to mind is adrift, floating about wheresoever the current takes you without being steered or having an anchor point. These words define the life without Jesus. A bunch of lost souls out there Lots of them floating about without anything to anchor their lives. Just pushed around by the currents of the world, of circumstances. A life being blown by unseen winds, carried by unseen currents to unknown destinations. Of course they don't see the purpose of life. They have no direction. That's what it's like to be without Jesus. But that's not what my life or your life should look like. Right? Because we're with Jesus, aren't we? Is there anybody here right now that's without Jesus? You don't know you have Jesus in your life. Is there anybody? Because you need to know Jesus. Ask yourself the hard question. Does your life sometimes feel like you're drifting aimlessly? Without a secure anchor point? Without any control over your direction or your destination? Many Christians, if we'll be honest, are living the same kind of meaning, meaningless lives that the world lives. They're living as if Jesus wasn't in their life. Do you know that? Christians living just like everybody else. But it doesn't have to be like that, and it shouldn't be like that. We need to be anchored to the rock that even if the winds blow, we're never blown away from the anchor point. We need to have the master at the helm that knows the way to go that can get us to where we are supposed to be. We should have a purpose in our lives. Our lives should be used for things that really matter. If your life seems aimless or purposeless or meaningless, then how do you get back on course? Because some of us have lost our purpose. We don't even know where we're going. We're just saying, I'm floating around until Jesus comes and picks me up. And Jesus says, I said, occupy yourself till I come because there's stuff for you to be involved in. Oh, and no, I'm just not going to occupy myself. I'm going to pack my bags and I'm going to sit on the, on the bus bench and just wait for Jesus and do nothing. That is not what God has called us to do. Okay. 
How do you become a people who has direction, purpose, and value? Direction and purpose and value to the one who's called you out of darkness, value to the one who's given you value. At times, do you, as a Christian, ever feel hopeless? Have you ever felt hopeless since you've been a Christian? Raise your hand. You know what? I understand because you're human, but you're still here. So I guess something worked out, right? But you felt hopeless. We all know what that's like, right? Do you feel like sometimes there's nothing you can pin your hopes onto? You're looking for, what can I pin my, I can't find anything to pin my hopes onto, right? That's how we feel sometimes in our desperation. I want you to know today that there is a hope that can be found. There's a direction that can be given. There's a purpose that can make life full of meaning, but not without him. It's impossible. Even though we who've accepted Jesus our Savior have him, we can lose sight of him and live a life as if he wasn't in our lives. Can't we? Let's never let that happen. You go, well, it's too late. Let's never let that happen from this day forward. Let's never let it happen again. Right? He's the one that gives us power, direction, purpose. Are you adrift like a ship without a sail? Then what should you do? Well, maybe you know part of the solution about what you should do, but not all of the solution. You know, do you have power but no direction? Or do you have direction but no power and these things cause you just to be stagnant? If so, what do you do? Well, there's a solution. And it, of course, involves Jesus because, as we all know, without him, you can do nothing. He's the solution to every problem, right? He can give you the power you need and the direction you need to accomplish the purpose he's called you for. And you know he's called everybody for a purpose. So if Jesus is a solution, how do we supply the solution? Do you rub Jesus on? Do you swallow him, a big dose of Jesus? How do we get him to work all this stuff out for us? When we have power but no direction, we do a lot of movement, but we just don't get anywhere, right? We end up wearing ourselves out, not accomplishing anything, because we're just running our wheels in circles. We all realize that we have a lot of things to do, don't we? Life is busy, isn't it? Our lives are very busy, and our time is very limited, and so much of the time we just run as fast as we can, and we do as much as we can. But if what we are doing has no true meaning, no purpose, then it's going to leave you empty. You're going to be running a race. You know, it's kind of like we're just chasing the sun from sunset to sunrise, just chasing, saying, at some point this ends, but no direction, right? Well, I want to direct you to Scripture, 1 Corinthians 9, 25, and 26. Running faster isn't the best solution. Running harder isn't even the best solution. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 9, 25, and 26. Everyone who competes in the games trains with strict discipline. They do it for a crown that is perishable, but we do it for a crown that is imperishable. Therefore, I do not run aimlessly. I do not fight like I'm beating the air. Paul didn't run aimlessly means he had direction. He had his eyes on the finish line, on a goal. Paul did not swing wildly at the air, but he saw his enemy and hit him with direct impact with force. Now, I want to be like Paul, but more importantly, I'm supposed to be like Paul. I'm supposed to, and you're supposed to not be running aimlessly, not be swinging at the air and missing, but actually running with purpose, running with a goal. And when I swing at the enemy, I hit him. That's the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? Paul understood that in this life, he needed to know why he was competing. He said, everybody competes for something. He goes, I'm competing for a crown that never perishes, right? He needed to know where he was running. He needed to know his goal, his target, his destination clearly ahead of him so he could fix his eyes on it and not miss it. 
Because if you're running on a different track than the rest of the team, <laughs> it's not going to matter. You're in a different race. Right? He also understood that while he ran, he'd have to be ready to fight. You notice he says, I'm running, but I'm also swinging. You got to realize, as you run, there's an enemy that wants to stop you from running. There's an enemy who wants to put obstacles in your course, and that's where you've got to be a hurdler, right? You got to be able to jump those things and keep moving. And there's an enemy who'll try to get in your face, and you've got to be able to swing and hit him, right? When the enemy would try to knock Paul off course, try to distract Paul, he'd engage him in Jesus' name. Jesus doesn't want us to live an undirected, misdirected life like the world's living. Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. That should not be us because we've got the chief shepherd in our lives. Without Jesus, that's what we all look like to God. A bunch of sheep running around aimlessly, hopelessly, without any grasp of where they're going, without a shepherd. But that's what life is like without Jesus. Even though God has sent us Jesus, if you and I aren't careful to keep our eyes on Jesus, we can find ourselves living a life as if he wasn't with us. Do you know that? I don't want to live that kind of life. Jesus found you and Jesus found me. The Father saw that you were lost and I was lost and he sent the shepherd so that we could be led in a direction. He took pity on us. It says he was moved with the compassion because he loved us. Ezekiel 34, 11 through 13 says this, For this is what the Lord God says, Behold, I myself will search for my flock and seek them out. As a shepherd looks for his scattered sheep when he's among the flock, so I will look for my flock. I will rescue them from all the places which they were scattered on the day of the clouds of darkness. I will bring them out from the people, gather them from the countries, and bring them into their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in the settlements of the land. God says, I search the earth looking for my sheep so that I can gather them together to where? To where? To the shepherd. So that I can lead them. So I can lead them into places. I can lead them beside the still waters. I can lead them into the green pastures. I can lead them into the places where my presence is, where my provision is. But many people don't want a shepherd. You know, there's a movement now where people don't want to be in church because they don't want to be accountable to a pastor. That's rebellion, because the heart that is unturned from God is in rebellion. Now, that's the way it's supposed to turn out for those of us that have been gathered by the shepherd. We should be brought to this place of feeding on the green pastures and the shepherd protecting us and providing for us. That's the way it's supposed to be. But if the sheep will not look toward the shepherd for his guidance, they can wander off. They can lose sight of who's with him, who's with them. And they can find themselves lost because they haven't kept their eyes on the shepherd. They haven't recognized and acknowledged who is with them. And without him, you're lost. You and I must be constantly mindful of being with Jesus because living life without him means you're lost. You've lost your way. John 15, 6 through 7, it says, if anyone does not remain in me, did you hear that? He's saying they were in me at least at one time, but he says they need to remain in me. You know, you can jump in and jump out. So here's what, that's what it says. I mean, Jesus said it, so I guess he knows what he's talking about. If any does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are gathered up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, I want to be a remainer, don't you? If you remain in me and my words remain in you. Oh, there's, a, there's, another, there's another thing that I have to add to that. He says, you can be in me, but you need to get your word, my words in you. Because it's his word that will guide you. Right? It says, if anybody remains in me and my words remain in them, it says, then you can ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. Now, Jesus said he'd never leave you nor forsake you. But what we just read says that we need to remain in him. So I want you to know something. Jesus will never leave you. He just wants you to never leave him. 
Okay? We're all busy in life, but if your life is too busy for Jesus to be included, to be involved, to be consulted, to be allowed to guide you, then you're living a life without Jesus. I don't want to live that kind of life. How often do we make decisions without Jesus? You know, air's not an option. I need it to live. Well, Jesus is not an option either. You need him to truly live. Jesus lets us make our own choices, but sometimes we choose wrong because we haven't gotten his wisdom and his direction in the matter. And we're afraid sometimes to ask him what he wants because he might want something that's different than what we want, right? Imagine that. God wants something different than you, so you choose what you want. That's not wise, is it? Jesus lets us make our own choices, but without his guidance, we're going to make some stupid choices. Even when you don't make a choice, you know, sometimes you go, well, I got A or B, well, I'll pray about it. You know, when God tells you to do something, don't pray about it, do it, right? But we think, I can buy some time here. I can buy a little time. Guys, that's not how it works. There is no in-between. You choose. So here's what it says, Deuteronomy 30, 15, and 16. See, take notice, look, I've set before you today life and goodness as well as death and disaster. Which one would you like? I've set before you life and goodness and death and disaster. How many do I have that are takers for death and disaster? Anybody here? Right? He says, for I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and statutes so that you may live and increase. And the Lord your God may bless you in the land that you enter in to possess. God's saying, you know what, that death and and disaster and all that stuff, he goes, I'd I'd rather not give you that. Really, I want to give you the blessing. That's what I want to give you. But I give you the choice. In this passage, he tells the people they have a choice to choose from. But it's not just a choice, it's followed by a command, okay? Dropping down to verse 19, the Lord states the choice again, but this time he says, and here's what you should do. Verse 19 in that same uh, chapter, which is Deuteronomy 30, it says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life. Choose life. I wonder what God wants us to do. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, and that you may love the Lord your God. Obey him, and hold fast to him, for he's your life. And he will prolong your life in the land that the Lord swore to give you and your fathers to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So we must remember that with the Lord, there is no change. He never changes. He's always the same. Every day, he's the same. He doesn't change his opinion. He's the same God, the Old Testament God, the same as the New Testament God. It's all the same God. He's the same yesterday, today, forever, yet I think sometimes we think since we're under a new covenant, we got a different God we're in covenant with. Oh, it's the same one. Our God isn't more easy. Our God's the same, okay? If we have a new God, he's more easy and less demanding and kind of lets you do what you want to do, and he just puts his stamp of approval on that. No, 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 it's the same God of the old covenant. He still sets before every person life and death. He still tells us which one to choose. He says, choose life. He still tells us that there's a blessing for choosing life, and there's a curse for choosing death. He warns us. But many believers have not truly made the choice to be fully all in and committed. They said, I'll pray about that. 1 Kings 18, 21. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you waver between two sides? If Yahweh is God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Even though he said, how long are you going to falter between Baal and God? Pick your God. And they didn't say a word because they're going, we're thinking. We're thinking. The Lord gives the choice, and we reap the benefit or the consequences from our choice. But what if we just don't choose? Well, there is a place in the middle between life and death, and it's called coma. Do you know a lot of Christians are in a coma because they won't choose? They're half in and half out. They're lukewarm. You know what that means? They're room temperature. You know what that means? That's what dead bodies do. They get to room temperature. You're technically alive if you're in a coma, but your body acts as if it was dead. 
That's what a lot of Christians are like. They're in a coma. This is where most Christians find themselves these days, living a life that's between the two worlds, and it's really no different than those that are spiritually dead in the world because they don't look any different. A body in a coma and a dead body look just the same. Revelation 3, 15 and 16, I know your deeds that you're neither hot or cold. How I wish you were one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. You know, that's not really a nice picture of Jesus, how he feels about his people. Well, I want to be the hot one. I don't want to be the lukewarm one. And I sure don't want to be the cold one. Now, let's be honest with ourselves. Are we living our life in a spiritual coma, pretty much dead, numb to the presence of, the, of God, numb to the voice of God, not involved, involving him in our everyday lives, but just once in a while when we got a big problem, we go to him? We shouldn't have to do life without Jesus when he's right there saying, I'm here, walk with me. Jesus is our life. He's our source of eternal life. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He's not just our life, he's our direction. The direction that leads us deeper into real life that the Father wants for us. Which way should we go? Well, Jesus said, I'm the way. How do we choose to go his way? How do we choose to be with him? Well, I'm going to tell you something. You got to stop faltering between the world and the church and say, I'm all in. Okay? And so you got to make choices. And the choices have to be def definitive. You have to say, I've made a decision and I'm going to follow Jesus with everything that's within me. And part of that includes this. It's very important because without him, you can do nothing. And when you don't realize that, that you're with him, in other words, you've kind of put him out of your mind and he's in the background, it's as if you're without him. So you want to be with him in presence. So what do you have to do? You got to make a choice. Are you all in? If you're all in, you got to make time, take time, and spend time with Jesus. I don't have time, I'm too busy. You need to act upon one very important thing. From your place of spiritual lack and loneliness, from your cold indifference, from your numbness to the things of the life of God, you need to say, Lord, I choose to seek you with my face, with my whole heart. And Lord, I ask you to breathe your life into me. I want to be on fire. I don't want to be a flickering flame. I want to be a blazing fire for you. John 10, 10, the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus says, but I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The problem is a lot of Christians aren't living in the abundant life because they're in the coma. You can't do a whole lot of fun things when you're in a coma. You don't experience a lot of the joys of life when you're in a coma, right? You're alive technically, but really you're as if you were dead. You don't want to be a Christian in a coma, a Christian that is between being all in for God and being in the world. You got to make a decision. You got to make time for Jesus. You got to put Jesus on the list, and then you got to move him up the list to first. You see, sometimes we put Jesus on the list, but we never finish the list in that day, so we never get to Jesus. You need to put Jesus first on the list, so even if you miss all the rest, at least you got to Jesus, right? I'm too busy. How can I make time? There's so much to do. That's a fool speaking. Because what you don't realize is without him, you're spinning your wheels and wasting your time. But with him, you can get a whole lot more done. Right? Is he first in your life today? Is he number two on the list? Is he number 14 on the list? If he is number one in your life, then he's going to bless you of all the other aspects of your life where you need the blessings, it's not just being with him, but he blesses everything that you do, every place that you go, everything that you say. It's all involved with him because you're with him. How important is it for you to be with Jesus? Well, Luke 10, 41 and 42. I'm almost done. Martha and Mary, they're both believers. They're both in the presence of Jesus, but one was a little further out in the kitchen and one was at his feet. But they were both with Jesus. They were in the same house. They were in the household of faith. 
But one was in a different room, not looking upon Jesus, but looking on a, a grill of, you know, fried eggs or whatever it was. But not looking at Jesus. The other was at the feet of Jesus. But they're in the same house. But they have a relationship with Jesus. Yeah, but they're not in the same place in the house. Here's what happened. Martha finally goes, come on, Jesus, get Mary off her, you know, her dusty behind. And get her in the kitchen to help me because, you know, there's a lot of stuff to do. And Jesus is like, you don't get it, do you? Here's what he said. Martha, Martha. Reminds me of the Brady Bunch. You remember that? Marsha, Marsha. It says, the Lord replied, you are worried and upset about many things. Woman, you need to chill out. You are worried and upset. <laughs> like, what is wrong with you, woman? Jesus is in your house. But only one thing is necessary. Well, no, there's a whole list of things. The only one thing's really important. And Mary has chosen the good portion, and I'm not going to take it away from her. Mary chosen what? To be at the feet of Jesus, listening to the voice of Jesus, the whisper of Jesus. Do you know she's so close to Jesus? She's at his feet, so close to him. That even if he whispers, she can hear him. But if you're in the kitchen cooking, you can't hear him because you're out of the presence of Jesus, even though he's in your house. You have to become aware of Jesus. You have to be at the feet of Jesus. You have to be looking in the eyes of Jesus, listening to the voice of Jesus. And you know where you're really going to develop that a lot? Prayer. Oh, prayer again. Oh, it's that old prayer thing. You know, Jesus prayed. He said it's an example. His presence is always open to us, but we must choose to go there. We must choose to remain there. Jesus is always aware of us, but we're not always aware of him. So we need to acknowledge him in all of our ways. Every time you wake up, say, I acknowledge you're right here with me. Every place you go, I acknowledge you're right here with me. And it says, if you acknowledge him in all your ways, he'll direct your path. You're burdened, you're tired, you have too much to do. You better get to it. You don't have a minute for Jesus. That's not how it works. Matthew 11, 28, 29. Come to me. You're burdened? Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm gentle, humble of heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. You know what? Everybody needs rest for their souls. If you will come and sit at my feet like Mary, I'm going to speak the words of life over you, and the weights and the burdens are going to melt away, and you're going to see what really matters. He's going to guide you in the right direction so that your foot will never slip. You'll never make a wrong choice. He'll change you into becoming like him simply because you spent time in his presence. That's what changes you. You go, I'm trying to work on myself and change myself so I can get to God and be holy. He's like, you've got to spend time with me to get holy. That's how it works. One more scripture here. I'm kind of cutting this thing short now, even though it's where we went over a little. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And he with unveiled face, and, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into his image with intensifying glory, which comes from the Lord. Do you know how you're transformed into his image? We who are beholding his face. It's the acknowledgement of I'm, my eyes are on you, Jesus, and I'm here with you, Jesus, and I've put you first on the list, Jesus, and I've chosen you. I haven't chosen something else on the list. I've chosen you. I've chosen to spend time with you first, and as I've got my eyes on you, then, Lord Jesus, you're going to take care of this stuff that I'm not getting to right now because you said the most important thing was for me to be with you. And as I'm with you, you're going to direct me. And you're going to alert me to those things that I need to get busy and do, but, but that's all going to come from you directing me, not me deciding what to do. And I'm going to let you direct me, and I'm going to keep my eyes on you, and I'm going to be with you, and I'm never going to be found without you. I'm never going to have a moment in my life where I say, I don't feel Jesus because I'm always aware of Jesus, right? Don't live life without him, right? Don't live life without him. Well, we've got to stop because it's that time. When you spend every moment of every day in a state of constant awareness of his presence, then everything you do is with Jesus. You can't go wrong there. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, oh, thank you for being with us. Lord, sometimes we're just too numb and dumb to realize your presence. Lord, Make us, like that song says, make us aware, more aware of your presence. Help us to put our eyes on you. You're the finish line. You're the prize. 
Help us to keep our eyes on you, focused on you. Help us not to be those that beat about the air and run in circles, but help us to be those who run the race with all their heart, who are all in for God, who are completely sold out, who are firebrands. We're on fire for you, Lord Jesus, and everywhere we go, we carry your presence, Lord. Help us to remain focused on you, Jesus. Today, Lord, we choose life. We choose life, and life is being in your presence, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that you would sow these seeds deep into hearts. You would cause them to take great root, and this would bear much fruit in everybody's lives that have heard this today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Tomorrow night is a thing called prayer. Come and join us, 7 p.m. Amen.